Okay, this is a continuation of arc length. This is the formula that we had for uh, a function of the form y is equal to f of x. Now I'm going to uh, do a little excursion into parametric equations. Depending on the textbook, if you look at various calc textbooks, some of them include this material in the section on arc length, and sometimes people have it in authors have it in their own their own uh, se section. But I, I think it's kind of interesting stuff. So, um, so uh, let me explain to you what a parametric equation is. Parametric equation, or a parametric function, is one which uses a parameter. Is that helpful? Uses a parameter. What do I mean by that? If we have y is equal to x squared, for example, then the way we graph it is we have the x-axis here and then uh, you know all about this and then uh, for every x value you determine what the y value is and you go ahead and graph it and in this case you get yourself a problem. So that's, uh, that's I'll call that the standard way of doing it. Another way of doing it is, is to have a parameter which is often t is used as a parameter and then both x and y are functions of this parameter t. So, so uh, x could be equal to t, for example, and y could be equal to t squared, and then as t takes on all these different values, x will take on those same values and y will take on the square of them, and you'll get exactly the same graph as you had before. And you ask me, well, what's the reason <laughs> for for throwing a parameter in if it just gives you another column to have to work with and how, how's that any advantage? And the reason is, is because there are some graphs on the plane which are very useful uh, to, to write in terms of, of uh, parametric equations. For example, if you want a, a circle of radius r, let's say capital R, centered at the origin, Okay, then here it is, it looks something like that, and the radius is r, and uh, we did this already the other day. You say, okay, what's the equation of a circle like that? Well, you say if this is the point x, y right here, then that means that that distance is y and this distance is x, and from Pythagorean's theorem, we have that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. So there's the equation of a circle. By the way, if you want the proof of Pythagorean theorem, go back to my uh, uh, Calc 1 lectures, uh, Essentials of Calculus, and you, you'll see how, how to prove Pythagorean theorem. It's kind of a nice proof. Anyway, if you want to get this in terms of, of uh, y, so you can think of it as a function, you can then write y squared is equal to r squared minus x squared, and so y is equal to plus or minus the square root of r squared minus x squared. Okay, so the positive square root gives you the top half of the circle, and the negative square root gives you the, negative, the bottom half of the circle. So the point is, I can get both of these halves of the circle as functions like this, but I can't get them together, okay? As a function, I either have this one or this one. There's really no way to combine them. I can keep them separate in my own mind, but there's not kind of a nice, easy way to just go from one to the other. If I want to jump from here to here, I have to jump from one function to the other. And uh, if you think about how many things in life center around the circle, you realize that's not very optimal. So here's another way to do it. Another way is by having a parameter. And so in this case, as I say, let's uh, let our parameter be t. And t is just going to stand for the angle. Okay, there's the angle t, in always measured in radians when you're, when you're in a calculus class. And then, if you remember from trigonometry, which again, you can refer back to my second or third uh, lesson in, in the Essentials of Calculus to get this, but if this distance, if this radius is r, and this angle is t, then the coordinates of this point are gonna be r cosine of t, comma, r sine of t. Okay, so there are the coordinates of the point in terms of t, so x, is equal to r, I need to make this a little bit wider, I guess. 
r cosine of t and y is equal to r sine of t. And now, as t goes from 0 to 2 pi, say, then um, this point is going to go all the way around the circle. And so you get, you get a, a, a parameterization, you get, you get the function that, that takes you all the way around the circle uh, as, as t, t, uh, t goes from 0 to 2 pi. If you want it to go backwards around the circle, then I think if you make this negative, then then uh, x will stay the same, but the y will be the negative, and it'll end up going going like this instead. And so, uh, so you can do it that way. If you want to go around the circle twice, you can make it go from zero to, to four pi, and you've gone around twice, and so on. So very nice. Okay, that's that's a very convenient way to to uh, write a circle. So given that we have these parametric equations, then we want the same sort of question as we did before. Can we find the length of a curve uh, in parametric equations? And the answer is yes, otherwise I wouldn't have asked it just now. So here's some sort of a, here's some sort of a curve. And so this is going to be at the point, uh, I'll, ca I'll call this the point x of 0, y of 0, right there. And this will be, say, uh, x of some value, at some value t. Let's just make it 3, uh, y of 3. Okay, so say it takes 3 seconds to transverse this curve. Okay, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and you're right there. So you've walked along, or you've gone along this curve, and at, at time equal to 3, you're right there. At all these other times, you're, you're along this curve. Okay, so t goes from 0 to 3. Uh, so, um, so given that, let's, let's just call it capital T as in, to make it a little more general. So there you are, capital T right there. Or, actually, to be really general, let's just do it like this. Let's call this x of t1, y of t1, and then this will be x of t2, y of t2. Oh, too many choices here in life. Okay? There you go. So, how do we find it? We do it the same way as before. We say, okay, I'm not going to go through this again because I've already done it, done it once. But basically you say this is a delta x right here, and this is a delta y right there. And so the length is what you get by adding up. Uh, it's approximately equal to what you get by adding up all of these, all of these um, hypotenuses. Okay, like that. Um, and then, let's see, what's the easiest way to explain this now? I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and say that, um, that the length then is going to be equal to what you get by summing up all of these things. So it's going to be uh, dx squared plus dy squared, like that. And then the last thing I'm going to remind you of is something, again, that is done in Calc 1, where the differential dx is just equal to dx dt, it's the derivative, times the, times the little change dt. So again, Leibniz's notation comes in handy. This quote unquote divides out with this and you get dx on both sides. So this thing right here, this goes from t1 to t2 and now this thing right here becomes what? dx dt. So I'm going to write it as dx dt quantity squared and then I have a dt squared there plus a dy dt quantity squared, and I have a dt squared there, and I'm going to pull both of those dt's out back, and they just become a dt. 
So there's your, there's your formula for the length of a curve in parametric equations. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll let you, it's just kind of a nice little problem, uh, go ahead and, and show that the uh, length of the circle using this formula is 2 pi r. And you can go ahead and do that and you'll, you'll get your answer, okay? So, um, so uh, that's the length of a circle. I want to do one a lot more interesting than that. This is one of the most interesting curves in, I think, in all of mathematics, and you need parametric equations in order to be able to, to draw it easily, okay? It's the curve that you get. First of all, it's called a cycloid. Okay? And it's the curve that you get by um, taking a, a bicycle tire and rolling this bicycle tire down the sidewalk. And I always imagine it like this. I imagine that there's some firefly that's, that's on the sidewalk and you roll over this firefly, this lightning bug, just as its little light is on and the poor thing gets squished into the tire but the light stays on and now someone across the street is going to see this little light on the edge of the tire on the rim of the tire and this edge is going to take a path kind of like this can you picture that as this thing rolls this thing is going to get all the way up to the top there and it's going to come back down and it's going to roll again so this is one complete roll by the time it's going all the way around it's not, a, it's not a circle, it's not a sine wave, nothing like that. It's its own shape. And let's go ahead and see if we can find the equations for this particular shape. And then I'll tell you why it's such an important shape. Okay, here, here are, let's figure out the equation. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start this right here. Here's your y-axis right there. And and uh, this radius will be capital R right there and now if you this is where I could use another color here if you move the let the wheel take a new position can you see that take a new position now what's happened? This point right here is now up there someplace. Agreed? Because it's, it's moved up. This whole thing has moved. This used to be right there. Now it's up there. And we want to find the coordinates of that point. Okay? What are the coordinates of that point? Well, here's what's happened. This angle here has moved from there to there. Let's say that that angle is T. That's how much it's moved. Okay? So what are the coordinates of the point? Let's first take the Y coordinate. Okay? What's the Y coordinate of that point, given the fact that you've moved through this angle T, that you've rotated this much? Well, first of all, this is a good review of a lot of, a lot of uh, trigonometry. First of all, remember the relationship between... An angle, the radius, and the arc length. By definition, the angle and radian measure is defined to be the arc length divided by the radius. That's the definition of an angle in radian measure. So in other words, the arc length is equal to the radius times the angle. Okay? So, um, so what's happened here? Um, well, let's see. Well, actually... Actually, um, I guess, <laughs> I guess I, I'm, giving you, I'm giving you this. Let, this pertains more to x of t. So let's go ahead and do x of t right now, okay? So x of t, what's, what are the coordinates of this point? The way we do it is we first ask how far has the center of the circle moved? So the center of the circle, if this, if this uh, 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 angle is t, then that means that this length right there is going to be t times r, the, 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 the radius times the angle is going to be t times r, and there's no slippage here, so if this is, if this is t times r, 
then this length here is also t times r, right? You're not spinning out or anything like that. That distance along here has got to be exactly the same as this distance. So t times r, or rt, is, is this is t, this radius is r, so this distance is r times t, which means that that distance is r times t. So the center of the circle has moved rt. So there's the center of the circle, but we want the, coord the x coordinate of this point. So notice that if you take the center of the circle, which is this distance, and you subtract off this distance, then you're going to get at the x coordinate of this point. So the x coordinate of the center is right there. What's this? Well, that's an easier trig function. That's just going to be r times the, the sine of this angle, right? Opposite over adjacent. So, so if this is t, then it's going to be r times the sine of t. Okay, I'm doing this a little faster than I do it in the classroom because I figure doing it right here, anyone who doesn't totally understand this can quick click it off or pause it and can go look at this angle and check it out and see that, that this length right there is going to be r times the sine of t. So there's your x coordinate. y coordinate is actually easier. It's given by the height of this center. The height of the center is just going to be r. Now that you have this height, now you have to subtract off this amount right here because you want to get this height, that height is this height minus this amount from here to here. And that is just going to be r times the cosine of t. See that? So there's the coordinates of the circle right there. Okay? So, um, so there's, the, there, there's the equation for a cycloid. And uh, let me tell you why a cycloid is such an interesting function. It turns out Way back in, uh, in the 1600s, uh, there were these two brothers called the Bernoullis, uh, Jacob and, and Johannes, or uh, John Bernoulli. And uh, like all brothers, they were very competitive. And they were both great mathematicians and physicists, and so they competed on that as well. And one of them came up with an answer to this question. He asked the question, if you've got, if you're on a slide, like a playground slide, which starts here and ends up right there, what's the shape of the slide which will get you from here to here the fastest just under the influence of gravity, okay? Assuming that there's no friction, it's a completely uh, frictionless, nice slippery slide and you go sliding down it, what will get you from here to here in the shortest amount of time? Um, it turns out that no matter what path you take, you'll always end up with the same speed once you get there. That's a conservation of energy problem, but one, some paths will get you there faster than others. Now, a typical answer would be to say, well, why not just take the shortest path? Okay, the shortest path, shortest distance, seems like it's a pretty reasonable choice, but it's not the best. And the reason is because if you start by going... If you start by going uh, down more, gravity is going to speed you up faster than it would right here. And so if you take a path like this, you're going to get more speed, and you'll actually, even though this is much longer, even though you actually come back up to it, you will actually get there faster going on this route than on this route. And it turns out that the shape that gets you from here to here in the minimum amount of time is a cycloid, an upside down cycloid. So take one of these and go upside down and, and you have a shape like that. And so from here to here, you wanna go from there to there, the shape that'll get you from there to there the fastest is gonna be the shape of the cycloid like this. So that's a rather remarkable property of it. As I say, one of the Bernoulli brothers solved it and to try to embarrass his brother, he posed it to the entire mathematical community saying, see who else can solve this. And he got some answers, and one of the answers was so beautiful that when he saw it, he said, this one had to be from Sir Isaac, referring to Isaac Newton. This one had to be from Sir Isaac. And they asked him, uh, they said, you're right. How did you know it was from Isaac Newton? And he said, reportedly, you can tell the lion by the size of the paw. In other words, this was such a beautiful, elegant, 
genius solution that he realized only only Isaac Newton would have been able to have come up with it. So, and he was right. It, that's that's who had done it. Okay. So, I'll, oops, I need to get back to my computer here. Make sure it's still recording me. Okay. Very good. Okay. So anyway, some interesting history. And it turns out that other mathematicians took this idea and they ran with it and they developed a whole new branch of mathematics called calculus of variations, which solves other problems as well, such as what's the shape of a hanging cable. If you take a hanging cable, like a, like a, a telephone line, and just let it hang, what shape does it take? And it turns out, if, that, if, if a cable has a load underneath it, if you're like a suspension bridge, and you have a load, and you're, you're suspending a bridge beneath you, then it takes the shape of a parabola, or very, very close to a parabola. But if it's just hanging under its own weight, and it doesn't have a load that it's supporting, then it's the shape of, it's called a catenary, which involves things like e to the negative x plus e to the x over 2, something like that. I haven't, can't remember exactly what it is, but something like that. And, uh, and, and it's that shape. And so the, the proof of that all comes through this area of mathematics called calculus of variation. So it's a lot of neat stuff. So as I say, oh, and here, here's another interesting property of, of the cycloid. It turns out that it not only gets you from there to there in the minimum amount of time, but also it has the property that no matter where you start a bead on, on, this, on this cycloid, if you start it here, 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 or way up here, all of those will get to the bottom in exactly the same amount of time. And, uh, and so it's called, that's called a, a totochrome problem because they all get there in exactly the same amount of time. So that makes it a really nice clock because most clocks that use a pendulum, the, 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 the pendulum, if you start it right here and just let it go swinging back and forth like this, or if you start it right here and let it swing back and forth like this, this one will take longer, okay? It's, it's not too much different. If the, if the angle is really small, it's not very much of a difference at all, and which is why if you see a grandfather clock in a store, that pendulum is barely swinging. It's just barely swinging. That angle is really, really small, so it's, it's pretty safe. But the point is, if you were to start it way up here, then, then the amount of time it takes to get back and forth is going to change with how high it is. But on this thing, it doesn't matter how high you start it, you start it like this and you just let it roll back and forth as much as it wants to and that amount of time is always going to be the same. So it makes a really nice clock. And so I think it was Huygens, is that who it was I think it was, if I'm not mistaken? He actually built himself a clock that there was a, a cycloid right here and this pendulum was kind of on a, on a little spring right here. And so as it moved, this thing could go longer. This could kind of go longer. I can't remember where it's longer and where it's shorter. It looks, it looks like, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But it, it changes length as it goes. And that, that, that little spring here will allow it to change length. And so it rolls right along that cycloid. And there you go. So lots of interesting math there, OK? Lots of interesting math. So anyway, the thing I want to do with this is I want to ask, what's the length? What's the length that an ant would go in going from, from here to here? If it goes, if this firefly goes all the way around here, what's the length? Okay? So um, let's, uh, let's get started on this problem. Again, I'm going to get you started and not finish it. So let's go ahead and write x of t is equal to rt minus r sine of t and y of t is equal to r minus r cosine of t, okay? So let's figure out what the length is. And let's first get some bounds for what the length is. This is a really nice problem, okay? Let's get some approximations. A lot of things in mathematics, you can't get exact answers, but you, 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 you can get PhDs. You can get your name in, the, in research journals just by giving boundaries and saying that the, the right number is between this and this, okay? So first of all, uh, in order for this point to go all the way around means that this circle has gone all the way around on its, on its uh, circumference. 
And so that means that this length here has got to be 2 pi r from there to there, because that's, that's one complete revolution of the circle has gone from there to there. So this length here is obviously going to be bigger than 2 pi r, because that's the length of the straight line. So there's one bound right here. Let's, let's let l be the length. Okay, so right away we know that l is bigger than 2 pi r. Okay? What's a bound that we could make for how big it is? What's, what's some number that we can say for sure is bigger than the length of, of, this, cyclo of this cycloid? Um, and again, this is a great problem, so I hate to give you the answer before you've had a chance to think about it, but go ahead and turn this thing off, the video off, and then think about it on your own. Okay, grab a cup of coffee, come on back, here you are. So here's what I'd suggest. How about this length right here? That length right there is, I'll say obviously, bigger than this length in here because you, you've gone far, farther out. So, so what's this length? This is 2r. This is 2r. So 2r plus 2r is 4r. And then this length right here is your 2 pi r, right? So, um, so we've got that, right? So we've got that, which, um, which is something bigger than, than this length. Can I improve on either one of those very easily? You see a way to improve? I see a way how to improve on this one. Can you come up with another another um, length, which is going to be obviously s small, less than this, uh, but, uh, but, but greater than 2 pi r, a better, a better approximation than this. As I say, you, you get a PhDs not only by finding things like this, but by bettering something that someone else has done. Here, here's another one. What about this? What if we figure out the length of this path from here to here and here to here. Do you agree that this path right here is going to be less than this? Seems right, right? So what's that going to be? Well, let's use Pythagorean's theorem again. This distance right here is just going to be pi r. That's half of this. And of course, this distance right here is going to be 2r. So Pythagorean theorem says that it's going to be the square root of 2r squared plus pi r squared. That's the length of this hypotenuse. And of course, we have two of these hypotenuses. So we've got two of them there. See that? So we've got that. And finally, we can um, do a little, a little bit of algebra here. Notice that I can factor the r out of both of these things. And if I do, it's going to be 2r. And I'm going to be left with 2 squared, which is 4, and then pi squared, 4 plus pi squared right there. Agreed? I factored the, I factored the r, r squared out. So that's less than or equal to L, which is less than or equal to, here I can also factor a 2R out. And what am I left with? 2 plus, 2 plus pi. Is that right? Is that right? I factored a 2R out of this. Well, I already had the 2 out. So I factor the r squared out, it comes out as an r, and I'm left with this. And here, I have, um, I have um, 2r out of both of these, I'm left with a 2 right there, I'm left with a pi right there. So kind of an interesting relationship here. Um, if you were to take the square root of each of these things individually, you'd get 2 plus pi, which of course you can't do. 
but it's basically saying that if I add those things together and then take the square root, it's going to be a smaller number than if I look at them both separately. So it's basically saying that the square root of a squared plus b squared is going to be less than uh, or equal to a plus b. Is that, is that true? Let's, let's take an example. If you take 3 squared plus 4 squared, uh, a and b would be 3 plus 4 is equal to 7. If you square these out, you're going to get 9 plus 16 is 25. The square root of 25 is equal to is equal to 5. Sure enough, 5 is less than or equal to 7. You know what? I'm just kind of thinking about this as I do it. I think this is called Jensen's inequality from, uh, from graduate school analysis. Okay? Someone, I'm sure if there's some mathematician who's watching that, they're saying, you idiot. Don't you realize that's uh, Jensen's or Jensen's inequality? Uh, but anyway, uh, here, here's two boundaries. Here's two boundaries on that. So we've got boundaries. Can we get the exact thing? Can we get the exact value? Let's see if we can do it. Okay, so I'm going to, um, oh, I don't know if I have room or not. Let's give it a try. L is equal to, we want one complete revolution of the circle. So it's going to be from 0 to 2 pi. And then it's going to be the square root of, I guess I erased my formula, but it, it, it was the derivative of x squared plus the derivative of y squared. So, so dx dt is just going to be equal to what? r minus r cosine t. Everyone agree? The derivative of this is going to be r minus r cosine t. And the derivative of y, is the derivative of r is a constant, and this is just going to be positive r sine of t. Okay? So what do we do? We first square this. First of all, notice that by the time I, I square all these things, I'm going to have r squareds here and r squareds there, and I'm going to have r squareds all the way through there. And I can factor out that r squared, and it's just going to come out as an r, and I can bring that r right out front. So I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of all those r's, and again, you, you check me out on this, and just make this a 1. So now I'm going to have 1 minus cosine t quantity squared. Plus sine squared. Okay? We got all that. Okay? Now let's see where we can go from there. It's going to be r, 0 to 2 pi. This is going to be 1 minus 2 cosine t plus, I'm going to save a little time here by saying plus cosine squared t, but I also have a sine squared t. And a cosine squared t plus sine squared t is going to be 1. So I'm going to get another 1 there by the time I'm done with that. Okay, check me out. 1 plus 1 is 2, so I've got a 2 here, and here I have a 2. So both of those things have a, have a 2. If I pull that 2 out, I'm going to get the square root of 2r times the integral 0 to 2 pi, 1 minus cosine t. Okay? Well, that's fine and dandy. But how do we find the antiderivative of that? And let's see. I should have thought of this before I started the video, but I think I remember what it is. Let's see. How, what's, what's the formula again? Here's what I remember from trig. Uh, there's a trig formula that says that... Um, Let's see, that, um, <laughs> uh, let's see, I think this is equal to, oh, here it is, here it is, the, the, the cosine of 2 theta, or 2t, let's just call it t, the cosine of 2t is equal to, um, is equal to cosine squared t minus sine squared t. Uh, 
uh, which is equal to um, let's see which is equal to um, uh, I'm trying to remember which one it is here it's going to be uh, it's going to be 1 minus sine squared t because cosine squared is 1 minus sine minus sine squared t which is equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared t see that so I think I'm in good shape now. So if I bring this over to this side and this to this side, I'm going to get 2 sine squared t is equal to 1 minus cosine of 2t. See that? So the point is, this value is always, is always just half of what this value is. So this thing right here, I can write as square root of 2r integral 0 to 2 pi, the square root of, instead of 1 minus cosine of 2t, if I let this be a t, this is going to be a t over 2. So it's going to be the square root of 2 sine squared of t over 2. These all are dt here. Okay. And now, I have no choice but to do some more erasing here. Sorry about that. And so this square root of 2 can come out front. I'm going to get another square root of 2. So that's going to end up giving me uh, 2 r times the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And now I just have the square root of sine squared. The square root of sine squared is just going to be sine. Sine of t over 2 dt. What's the antiderivative of that? The antiderivative of that, we could use another substitution if you want to. Well, let's go ahead and do it. u is equal to t over 2. So du is equal to um, is equal to dt over 2. And so this is going to become what? The sine, the integral of the sine of u dt is 2 du, so I'm going to get a 2 out here, du. Now we need to change the limits of integration. When, u is equal, when t is equal to 0, u is going to be 0. When t is equal to 2 pi, u is going to be pi. So you get that right there. So this is going to be 4r times the integral of the sine from 0 to pi. And that's one you should just know. That's equal to 2. You can do the antiderivative. But anyway, that's going to be 2. And so you end up with 8r. 8r as your answer, which is really a cool answer. Because first of all, you can notice that 8r, uh, which you can think of as being uh, 8r as being, as being 2r times as being 2r times 4, right? 2r times 4. And if you uh, calculate these values right here, this is 2r times this quantity right here. If you take pi squared and add 4 and take the square root, you get 3.7. And if you take pi and add 2 to it, you're going to get 5.4. So, uh, so all these things have a 2r in them. But this one is a 3.7, this one is a 4, and this one is a 5.4 which means that uh, the actual length is closer to this lower bound than it is to that upper bound, which looks right, right? It looks like you're, you're closer to this one than you are to that one. So that's kind of cool. And then the last thing that's just super cool about this is that, that the, the exact length is, is 8 pi. So, I'm sorry, 8 r. So it's, <laughs> it's 8 r. It's 8 times the radius. What other things can you think of? I can't think of any dealing with a circle which does not have a pi in it. I mean, if you talk about the, the circumference of a circle, the circumference of a circle is, what, 2 pi r. The area of a circle is uh, pi r squared. The, the um, area of, of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. 
the, the volume of the sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. What thing involving a, a circle or a sphere doesn't have a pi in it? Everything does, except for this cycloid. If you take the, the, the path going on the cycloid from, from point to point, when you hit the sidewalk, it turns out to be just exactly eight times the radius with no pi in there. So it's really kind of cool. So there you are. There's some neat history, uh, a lot of good mathematics there, a lot of good stuff. So hope you enjoyed it. Uh, next time we get into, I can't remember, you'll have to wait and see.